you already know, my name is Vanessa Petro, and the relocation study that we're currently conducting with nuisance fever is within the healthy watershed. And right off the bat, I want to make a disclaimer or preface this presentation by noting that our goal of this project isn't to promote fever relocation or dissuade it. Essentially, what we're trying to do as our main goal is to better understand fever responses to relocation efforts. So that way we can not only um, evaluate their responses, but essentially see what, how fever relocation in the future can be more efficient. So why is this so important? Well, first of all, as many of you know, fever relocation is of huge interest right now. Why is that? Well, there is a significant amount of research um, that has been conducted, especially by fishery biologists, that state that beaver have all these you know, positive impacts on fish communities, especially on salmon. And you could pile the literature of those positive impacts from the floor to almost the ceiling of this bridge. And with that, um, there's an interest, especially on, within the coast of Western Oregon, that we can find the salmon population, specifically Coho, um, knowing that beaver have such a potential through their damming behaviors to create more rearing habitat for coho salmon, um, people want to take advantage of that. And that's also coupled with the fact that in watersheds like um, our study area, the LC, there's been a claim that the beaver population is in decline. So with all this background interest, a lot of people are like, okay, why don't we kill two birds with one stone, bring these beavers in, or they don't necessarily have to be these beavers, but let's bring beavers in from populations where they're higher, and bring them into locations not only where we can reestablish populations, but also re potentially restore uh, salmon habitat. So it's, it's a great concept by all means. It's definitely taken advantage of the natural engineer. The only problem is that, like I mentioned earlier, the amount of literature that says, you know, beavers have positive impacts on fish goes from the floor to the ceiling. But the amount of relocation work on beavers that's actually been conducted worldwide maybe this thick. <laughs> and that's bringing up all the sheets, including literature cited, maybe that thick. So there is, you know, you've probably heard there's other relocation projects going on across um, the western United States. But the problem, well, it's not so much a problem, um, there's a huge difference in the approaches that each relocation project is taking in terms of how they define a release site, and how do they monitor the beavers, and what they define as a successful release or relocation effort versus a failure. And because there's so much variability, we decided, for the purposes of our research, we were going to be the first study that actually took pre-existing models and used them to determine where in the landscape it would make the most sense to release beaver. So the two models that we used were um, actually developed locally in Western Oregon. The first model is a um, the co the hip model for coho salmon, which is essentially a model that predicts on the landscape where the most suitable locations for rearing habitat are. And then the other model we use uh, looks at where on the landscape, um, especially while well, it was developed within the Alice watershed in one of the sub-basins known as Drift Creek. I'm sure most of you have heard of the Drift Creek area. Um, and within that study, researchers actually went out and they walked almost the entire sub-basin. And they noted, um, after high winter flows, they went through and they noted every location that they found a persistent beaver dam. And so they went back. Um, they also collected habitat data at each dam. And they went back and ran a series of statistical models to figure out between physical and vegetative um, factors, what correlated with where those beaver dams were. And so, Doug, it sounds very convoluted, but just to give you a background of why we decided to use these models. So, we took both of the models, ran them, and then wherever there was overlap, that was our designated release site within the Alice watershed. Hopefully you can see some spots are red, some are yellow from where you're sitting, and then there's definitely spots that stick out the stream networks that have both colors. And so that's what we, as I mentioned earlier, that's how we decided 
to determine our release sites because we want it to be testable and that way if we learn that this, these locations work, we can go to other people and say, this is what the beavers in our watershed were looking for in terms of, you know, habitat cues. This is what you should target in other locations, or at least they'll be similar to other locations. So this slide right here I know causes a lot of panic and chaos, and a lot of people don't agree with it. And I'll get to that in a second and I'll explain it more thoroughly. But when we ran the models, Keep in mind that we were looking at the highest suitable habitat for both coho bearing and also beaver dam building. So we were essentially targeting those high, high suitability building ranges because we wanted the biggest bang for the buck in terms of conservation value. And so when you run the models, you find that within the entire Elsie watershed, there's only 152 miles of stream habitat that's of high suitability for coho. And then for beaver dam establishment, where they're most likely to persist, there's only four months. And when you overlay both of those model outputs, there's only one stream mile in the entire watershed. And the reason why a lot of people have issues with this, especially you know, locals who live in the area and professionals who have worked in the watershed, everyone's like, there is no way there's only one stream mile. I remember seeing beaver dams everywhere at Lobster Creek. I've seen beaver dams here. Yeah. Totally understandable. But keep in mind that this is modeling the highest suitable habitat in the entire watershed. And this kind of also, I mean, the response also emulates what's been going on with other relocation projects in terms of what works and doesn't work. Because by us standardizing, you know, how we choose to release sites, it can be repeated. Whereas if everyone puts in, you know, their own two cents about what they think is a suitable area to give place fever, you might have your own opinion for, you know, what you think is a suitable habitat. You might have your own, your own idea in your head of what might be a great place for fever to be released, and so on and so forth. So again, this is just a way for us to standardize and test it and produce, hopefully, more above results. So. Out of that one mile of stream habitat that we are able to delineate, it's actually spread across 19 sites throughout the entire Alpha watershed. And all the sites are located on both a mixture of private and public land. So there's, um, for public land, it's on both the Sayusla National Forest and the BLM. And for the private land, um, it's mixed between large industrial landowners and small private landowners. So once we finally get over that initial hurdle of trying to decide well, where we're going to put these beaver, we then go out and we check out these sites to see if there's actually beaver there. Because the last thing we want to do is release beaver on top of other beaver colonies that are already established in these locations. So out of the total of 19 sites, we we're only able to acquire permission to access 17 of them. And out of those um, 17, we walk the stream and we look for signs of beaver activity, and we even go beyond you know your typical signs of you, there's that picturesque beaver dam and runs. Because you have to remember, not every beaver builds a dam, so we look for um, signs like your typical runs, but we also look for food rafts that are kind of in the back of pools, um, and we a lot of times too, if you're observing them, you can find beaver scat, which essentially look like dense piles of sawdust the sink to the bottom of the pools. And so after we completed all of our site verification surveys, out of the 17 sites, I think 35% of them were already occupied, occupied by beaver. So that to us is pretty good news so far. And knowing that there's beavers already occupying these potentially high suitable locations. So the next step in our process, before we release the beaver, we go through and we collect habitat information at each of these 17 release sites, including the ones that have beaver occupation. Why do we do that? Well, there's three main reasons. One, we want to collect baseline information because we want to compare the habitat variables against what the model said should be there at that location. The second um, reason is that if in the event that we release beavers into an unoccupied release site and they create dams, 
we can use another model, because we can't get enough of them. Um, we'll use a third model that was developed by fisheries biologists at ODF and W to actually model the change and see how much beaver damming activity has actually increased coho production or productivity within the area by the increase of water surface area. But in the event that we release the beavers and they say, no, thank you, we're not interested in the site and they move elsewhere, we'll go to where they're establishing themselves and we'll collect, we'll use the same methodology and we'll collect the same exact physical and vegetative habitat characteristics to see what it is that these beaver are showing up that they're interested in for where they want to set up house and home. And that way, by collecting those measurements, we may be able, since we're at the perfect advantage to follow these beaver, um, we're at the advantage that we can further refine beaver damming models. So that way we can be even more specific and more exact. Um, or we might learn in the end that beavers don't care, it's completely random, and they just go with what, we're, what, go with what works best for them. After all the habitats collected before they chew it all down, <laughs> we go ahead and we start contacting any landowners that have potential nuisance beaver problems. And the reason why we use nuisance beavers is because we're trying to bridge um, the human wildlife conflict. So why not see wildlife um, that are causing an issue and try to put them to work creating good? So let's see. I, worked, I collaborated with 14 different trappers, and I essentially had the entire Alsea watershed covered and about a 100-mile perimeter outside of it. So the odds were good that if any beaver made a bad move, I was going to care about it. <laughs> um, and a lot of our track sites, too, were a mix of both private landowners and public. Um, I did a lot of tracking for the at one site up in the same way. So, Everyone we trap at each release site um, receives a health check, a microchip. Um, we check for abnormalities. We take biopsy samples because we're curious. You know, we want to confirm their um, gender. We want to know about their genetics, and we also want to try and see if we can um, examine possible disease. And we only sedate the adults and subadults because only they will actually see a transmitter, which I have with me. You guys want to get an idea of how large babies are? Go and test them around. And these transmitters are really neat. Um, they have both an active and a mortality mode. So, in the event that the beaver is inactive for eight hours, which is a bad sign, mm -hmm. it will send out a different type of signal to alert me that something's wrong, and then I'll go in and check on it and see what happens before we get too far out on that. So, um, like I mentioned, only adults and sub-adults receive the transmitters. Um, you don't put them on juveniles or young of the year because that transmitter is about the width of their tail. <laughs> so, body ratio-wise, it doesn't work out. And to attach them, as you can see, we actually have to drill a hole in the tail. And because we have to drill a hole in the tail, as you can see by the default tool, um, that's why we sedate them for their welfare. So once everyone is drug drilled and measured, we go ahead and proceed to place them into dog kennels and while we're transporting them to the release sites, um, they spend their recovery time as they're waking up from sedation in those kennels. So it's a great advantage to us um, to take advantage of that time as opposed to sitting along the stream for about three hours waiting for a beaver to finally come around and up to the point where you can release them into the water without worrying about the possibility of them drowning. And so, when it comes to relocating the beavers, we respond to a trap site, we'll trap out everyone we possibly can, um, and we move everyone to the same release site. So colonies move as entire units, but we don't always get everyone on the same day. So day one, we might get mom and dad, day two, we might get you know older sister, younger brother, but we always make sure that everyone is by which they are trapped on gets released to the same site. And so far from what we've seen, they always find a way to link back up because the first set of beavers that were released don't move that far. So even though you're 
separating out the days that you're releasing individuals. It, it seemed to work out for us. Yeah. So, after an individual is released onto the landscape, um, we intensively monitor their movement and survival, starting out with visits of three times per week. We'll walk in on them in the daytime, check to see where it is they're denning, um, have they suffered a mortality, did they rip the transmitter off, so on and forth, so forth. And when we begin to notice that the beavers are exhibiting kind of like an establishment behavior where they're no longer bouncing around the stream network to the landscape and they're sticking to one location, um, I'll go in and I'll conduct surveys, I'll walk the stream to check for dams, and if there's a culvert nearby, I'll also check to see if they're actually plugging them. Or, sometimes if you're lucky, or not lucky, depending on how you look at it, um, you'll walk in on the beaver before the mortality signal goes off, and you'll find that the mountain line is so nice to catch it and bury it for you, and the only way you can find it, by from the signal, is the fact that you can see the underside of the transmitter from the way we place the washers and the bowl on it. Oh, before that, this is where I brought this equipment. So who has the transmitter? <laughs> so just to give you an idea of what it is that we're listening for when we're out on the landscape, chasing these, these guys down. This is a bad transmitter. Could that be? It's not good. It's like a flick or is it real beef? It's a real beef. This is a bad transmitter. That's why it's kind of like my show everyone the transmitter and won't put on the paper. So it's probably close enough that we can hear it with this. Hear that beep? Yeah. So that's what we listen for when we're out checking on everyone. And what's, what's the range of the transmitter? Um, those move highly variable. If you're lucky, you can get about a mile. Oh. Um, a lot of times what the beavers will end up doing, I don't know where it went, if I can see that real quick. Um, because they're communal um, and they take part in social grooming, even though this is attached to the um, upside of the tail, some of the beavers will actually start chewing off the antenna. Yes. <laughs> so that, of course, reduces the range of this. <laughs> so it becomes really hard in the daytime when they're getting underneath an undercut or underneath a root lot. The signal is so low that sometimes you have to be within 50 feet in order to hear them. But luckily, luckily, some of those beavers that are that bad, they have been in that area for so long that we know essentially where they're at. And so we can just walk in and have a good idea of where to go to find them. But just to give an example of what it is we listen to about six hours a day. <laughs> on the so you guys might be wondering, okay, well, what do these release sites look like? And so I'll take you on a brief tour of three of the sites. Um, that we're currently studying. So the first one is located in the Upper Alsea watershed. And keep in mind that the photos, I don't know how well you can see them, the water level is really low because I took this at the end of the summer. So ideally in normal conditions, there's a little bit higher water flow. And at this site, um, I'll explain everything here. So at this site, we, we were able to release an adult, male and female, with the kids. Everyone was released on separate days, but managed to find each other. And keeping in mind, we can't keep track of the juveniles because we don't have transmitters in them. We only have the microchips. So the only way we can account for their survival or movement, excuse me, with the adults is if we catch them on a remote camera sensor unit that we put up at sites. But for now, um, these are the points of mom and dad. And so right after we release them at the release site, which is the big red line up on the stream, um, they began the process, once they were linked up, they began the process of slowly moving downstream. Um, one night they apparently had a fight or something because they fucked in den, separate dens, which was kind of unusual for them. Because they typically were finding them together. Um, they continued their way down the stream. They, went as far as uh, the main stem, turned around, and as you can tell by this cluster of points, within two weeks of being released on the landscape, they actually settled down in that location and constructed five dams. And I call them my all-stars because they are the only beavers I've released, or we've released, that actually constructed any dams. <laughs> 
And here's some examples of what they were doing um, once they found their ideal location right now. Um, most of the time they were consuming from what we could see about foraging activity. They were mostly interested in salmonberry and vine Um On occasion, they were definitely going after alder saplings, um, and very rarely. This is one of two, um, I would say, large diameter trees that they actually cut. Both of them were about maybe six inches in width. But what's really interesting to me and others is that being that they were the only beavers that actually constructed dams, their dams weren't that great. Well, we're going to be honest. I mean, it's great. Uh, this is not your picturesque dam that we're all used to seeing in pictures. Um, because they mostly built it out of the vine maple and salmonberry food scraps. And they used, you know, whatever um, sun that was available in the pool that was formed behind the dam wall itself. And all five dams looked like this. They were only about six feet wide and maybe a foot and a half tall. And unfortunately, with this past high water event we had with all the se severe flooding, um, all five dams got blown out. So all that work, unfortunately, is now gone. And I don't know if you can see it in your seats, but you remember how I had that picture of the scat that I said looks like um, condensed piles of sawdust? You can see a couple of them lying here in the water. Maybe, maybe not. But I'm here. So another example of a site that we released deeper at um, is located in the midsection of the watershed. And this site, um, had pre was previously occupied by beaver. You can tell by the historical signs of foraging activity, um, some of the remnant dams, old uh, bank lodges, so on and so forth. Um, and as you can probably tell from your seat, you can see that as it transitioned into a beaver meadow, your know, grass came in and kind of took over the place. <coughs> so that picture was of the really site taken at the upstream portion. And at this location, we released three beaver, all three were adults, one male, two females. And within the first week, everyone was kind of bouncing around between the release site and upstream. And finally, the younger female, um, the two adults, um, I don't know what happened with the dynamics, but she eventually moved out and started bouncing around the drainage. Um, the male, the adult male and female stayed together. Um, we're mostly concentrated up here, but later on, about two weeks after I released these beaver, um, I know I found the male dead down on the main stem, and it turns out we had a necropsy and he had died of tularemia. How we got it, we have no idea. Um, he was on the landscape for a little over two weeks, and that's about the incubation time for tularemia for aquatic mammals. So we don't know if he had it when we trapped him from his original site or if he somehow attained it at the new site. We'll never know. But after he died, the adult female that was with him um, stayed in this vicinity and she was exploring the area. She left this site, went up this tributary for a little bit, hung out, went downstream just a little bit. But she, I never have reported her going any further past this point. And currently, as you can tell by the cluster of points, this is where she's primarily located. And I don't know if you got the seven beaver that we released, primarily stuck around the release site. In fact, I think at least three or four of them would share the same den. And you could just take the receiver, stand on top of the den, and just click through all of their frequencies and know that they're all there. Then, about two weeks later, I drive up, turn on the receiver, and I hear a mortality signal, and I hear no one else. I started to think there was something wrong with the equipment, because that's weird. You go from one day, you hear about seven beavers, to you only hear a mortality signal. So I hiked in, and lo and behold, one of the beavers I found was cached, killed by a mountain lion. And after frantically searching and driving the ridge lines, I eventually found the rest of the surviving colony three miles in. <laughs> so is it correlation? We don't know. Is it, did the beavers pick up and swam away because of the predation pressure? We don't know, but it's interesting to note that they went from being primarily staying within the vicinity of the release site to as someone, as soon as someone got paid, everyone would get out. <laughs> What's really interesting is um, after everyone moved downstream, from that point forward,
or nobody when you're coming upstream, which is the points you see here and here and here, nobody ever went past this tributary, which I find really, really interesting. Um, and present day, all of those fuses are gone or dead, unfortunately. Um, both of them to tradition by mountain lines, unfortunately. It seemed like when Really sad. So they started out with predation pressure from mountain lines, moved downstream. Some of the individuals became established down near the slough, other individuals became established in the midsection, and mountain lines managed to find them everywhere else within that basin. It's about five minutes. Okay. So just to summarize everything that we've um, accomplished so far in our research, we were able to relocate 38 beaver. Uh, most of them were adults. And in terms of mortality, I don't, because the numbers keep changing every week, I don't want to give out percentages or numbers anymore, but we have been able to identify three cause-specific agents, um, the largest being cougar predation, human-related drug kills, and of course we've had disease um, show up within our individuals that we found dead. Movement, um, as I was showing you guys earlier, it's about a mile. The only reason why it's around, I think mid-December is actually lower than a mile. And the reason why it bumped up to 1.3 miles is some of the beavers, um, after they've been released, they establish themselves, we've noticed that if a mate gets taken out um, by predation pressure or roadkill, that beaver, the surviving member, responds by moving away from the release site a few miles downstream. So that movement right there kind of ups the average on us. Um, the record distance is about 12 miles, that female. Um, we release her with a, a, an adult male, we assume, because you're trapping on that one trap site, that there are a, a unit could be trapped both on the same day, moved to the same location. But once we move her, um, she beelined it out of there. She <laughs> wanted nothing to do with that release site. I would love to know the total tally of how many waterfalls she went joyriding over to get away from that release site in that yellow river. But eventually, 12 miles later, she found home <laughs> that met her standards. And like I mentioned earlier, out of the 38 beaver we released, only two of them, the adult male and female pair at the first site I showed you, were the only ones who actually constructed the dams. The dams themselves, like I mentioned earlier, weren't anything really special. Small diameter material, not that wide, not that tall. Um, but maybe with time, they would have grown in size. We won't know unless they initiate dam construction behavior. And um, out of all the beaver, I have one bachelor beaver, as I like to call him, because he lost his mate. Um, he is notorious, and I swear he is in love with this one culvert, because he will not stop plugging it. <laughs> Um, and he actually lives in one of our release sites. And every now and then, it's, it almost seems like weekend trips too, I'll go to walk in on him, see you know, what he's, what he's up to, and I'll get his signal you know, from a small drainage that's right above the release site. And he'll make these small trips up to visit this culvert because there's a really nice pool that has formed behind it. So he'll go up there and hang out for a few days watch me and listen to me on what the culvert, because um, <laughs> I'm not that happy. <laughs> and he'll leave, go back down to the release site, do his normal business, and about three weeks later, I'll find him again up near that culvert, hugging him. But that's the only case we've had so far, and we really started releasing beaver back in September, and we finished filling the last site um, at the end of December. So a lot of, some of these beaver have been out for only seven months. Other beavers have been out for only about two, three months. So. But that's it, guys. Um, are there any questions? I know I just threw out a lot of information to you, but as you can tell, I get really excited about this. <laughs> so were they building dams where they're being problem beavers? Were they, in the, did they already know how? Or were they good at it? Or Where they were originally causing damage? Yeah. Yes. Um, so, out of the 38 beaver, the majority of them yeah, were constructing dams um, and creating issues with the landowners. Who they like building dams down there, but not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, some of them we definitely know they have it in them.
So is, is it just a matter of time that they'll eventually be like, oh, okay, I think it's time we finally get around to building a dam, or maybe they just don't care and other needs are being met. We don't know. And that's what we're hoping to see as this uh, study continues. So how we'll long keep, are you going to be doing it? So we'll keep tracking them until mid-fall or possibly later. But the batteries on, on the transmitters are about two years. So if we can keep them on, we'll be for two years. And they stay alive. Uh, a similar question on the dam. Um, we've got the same experience. The, the people are in our stream, they'll build a dam and it gets blown out all the time. Is it your expectation that they would be building dams that would last through these water events? Um, based off of where we chose to put them? Sorry? Based off of where we're choosing to put them? No, just them? in general. You but, would hope for it. Um, these, these water events are pretty powerful. I, I don't know if they can build them then it would last through more of it. Do you think they would? Right. Um, well, from my understanding of the history of flood events um, within the coast range, even so, the classic example is definitely within our watershed in the Lots of Creek area. A lot of biologists attest that the dams that were constructed there once upon a time were large, they were mainly constructed out of large diameter material, they were more durable, they took harder beatings by high water events until the flood of 96 that was just powerful enough to take out everything. Um, but on, I would say on an average, level being, you know, your typical flood events that you see like we just had this winter. I don't really, don't, how do I really say this? Maybe our viewers aren't very smart either. Yeah, well, I wouldn't say smart. I just feel they could do more, but they're just not doing it. And I don't know if it's because their needs are met, because what's the main reason why they were built again? I did. Uh, security, exactly. Yeah, so if that beaver feels that its security needs are met, why waste the time building a dam? That's one thing we think about. It's like, why work harder when you can work smarter and just live in a main stem with deeper pools and not have to worry about building a dam? And all you have to do is crawl out of the water every now and then, cut down a few salmonberry sap or salmonberry stems, forage, and you don't have to exert as much energy. So yeah, that's a tough one. It's there's so many variables that go into that. What time of year do they usually have the kids? The kids? That should actually uh, soon be starting. I think it's don't quote me on this. I think it's mid March into April. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if they build the dams if they have kids. Oh, if there's a correlation? Yeah. That I don't know. Um, that is definitely an interesting question. I'd have to look at the literature. Mm -hmm. But typically, and the reason, um, I didn't mention this earlier, the reason why we released the beaver um, late fall is because other studies have found that that's the strongest time of year, that, or the time of year that beavers have the strongest desire to actually construct dams. So whether or not that's also not only in relation to the increase the water level or the start of it, but does it have something to do with kit rearing? I'm not sure. Yeah. So, um, so you have, it looks like you had 11 sites. Um, oh, sorry, so nine release sites out nine of release sites. Okay. the seven so to figure the percentages. And so they, have, they move an average of 1.3 miles, so did they move, and the habitat was, great, was greater, I presume, was the habitat they moved into very similar to the, the high quality release site? So, so you're asking, was the location that they moved to similar, yeah. if at yeah. all, to similar the release so sites? Have, have yes and no. <laughs> so then you don't think you have enough data to make any conclusions about what a high quality release That would be. We don't know until the end. Like I mentioned earlier, we're definitely going to go in, and if they have established outside of the release site, um, we'll take measurements and compare it against the release site. And again, there's this whole issue of perception where, as I just answered, yes and no, but when we actually get out there and collect the data and see how many sims there are per acre and see the actual you know, average channel width, we might realize that they are similar. And it was just that the model never picked up on it. So that's kind of an answer that we'll find out about down the road once we get further along and 
recording my data with the question there, and then one or two back here. How much of a role does a uh, fourth um, page class play in your habitat suitability Um, For selecting sites, almost none. In fact, the dam establishment model that we use, they graded, they collected both physical and vegetative habitat characteristics. And the physical characteristics graded higher by far than the vegetative characteristics. And if I can remember, I think the only vegetative characteristic that was even close in ranking to the physical stream attributes was, I think, percent canopy cover of all of them. And that was it. What, what sort of physical, I'm sorry, uh, what sort of physical attributes were in the model that were high, high Okay, quality? so the three strongest variables that had the most correlation with where beavers were building dams um, included the active channel width, so that's uh, the bank width of the stream, and then valley floor width, so how far out in a 100-year event does the water channel actually expand out to to reach its Beaver dams seem to appear to persist longer in gradients less than 4%. Of course, once you can start going up in gradient, you're increasing the velocity of water coming down, and that is negative, yeah, negative influence on the system. Who? Did you hear your Okay, you haven't said much about denning behavior, and I'm wondering what's the consistency of denning as they move around areas what does it provide for them in the, in the long term or short term? Right. Um, Denny is something we're actually not looking at in this study at all because we just we already have so much going on with trying to analyze their movement and survival. Um, I can say, and we can't prove it, but based off of observation, and granted this is filling our results, um, because we're only halfway through the field season of monitoring these beaver, it appears that a lot of these beaver that we are relocating onto the landscape are taking advantage of previously excavated dens by other beaver. So again, this brings up the question, much like why are, why are they not building dams, is it they're working smarter and not harder? We don't know. Um, but it's something I would love, if I had extra time and money, I would love to research den fidelity. But our beavers, um, aside from the appearance of that they're using previously, Occupied dens. Um, most of the, well, I shouldn't say most of the time, but a lot of these beavers, some of them have high fidelity to these den sites. And you can tell by the cluster of points on the streams. I mean, it almost becomes too predictable when you go to check on a beaver. You know it's going to be under this large diameter alder, or you know it's going to be in this undercut bank. But time will tell. Maybe in two months, everyone will switch and go to a new den and start the whole game all over again. Well, hold on. No, <laughs> one last, I was going to say one last question, but um, go ahead, Gary. No, I'm done. Okay, Jim, who wants it? But, um, have you taken any preventative measures on the culvert? I mean, do you try to keep them from doing, you know, plugging the culvert, or do you just let it happen? We, so that beaver that I was discussing, he's been in a weird case. So, <laughs> I, and the landowner, I've already contacted the landowner to give him a heads up. Hey, one of our beavers, our study beavers, is in the area. He's, continue, he's been you know, in love with your culvert and he likes to plug it. So right now we've worked out an agreement um, that I'll go in, I'll unplug the culvert, and in the event that he sticks to plugging it on a regular basis, we're actually, because I also represent not only OSU, but Wildlife Services, which is USA APHIS, um, if it, if it just becomes a regular routine, which so far he's starting to wean away from it, then he's actually behaving. Thank goodness. <laughs> but now that I say it, it's probably better <laughs> as we speak, plugging it on. Um, so in the event that he does still become or remains persistent, um, we'll recommend a management action um, for the landowner, but we'll pay for whatever that management action is, whether it's coming in and building a palm leveler. Um, Putting a fence, building a fence in front of the culvert, you know, creating such an angle that it would actually distract, or not distract, but deter the beaver from trying to plug it. So, so there, if, are, there are various techniques you just haven't yeah, used yet. Yeah, there's definitely a, a variety of techniques out there to mitigate the situation, but the, most landowners we talk to, they're like, well, let's just see what happens. 
especially that. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs>